Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through the design way. We are coming to the end of design way. And today is one of the most complex chapters, important chapters on systemics. So really looking forward to this one. So we're gonna start with uh, David followed by Joe, um, Maritza and Mike. David, go ahead. Okay. So, yeah, there was a number of things in this chapter that I found interesting. I'll, I'll just focus on maybe two things. One was the, um, the complex phenomena. And I liked his concept of using the station point or the standpoint to be able to look at complex things and doing it so that you gain a different perspective. Um, and you know, he makes reference to this systemic world approach, which you can make visible through a compound of multiple projections of images that are illuminated from different standpoints by a coherent perspective. And I found that, that paragraph or that, that sentence very powerful. Then when I flipped the page and saw figure 3.9, it really gelled where you have a common object, but as you changed your perspective and illuminated it from a different standpoint, it showed a different result or a different image. So I found that very, I found that very helpful. And I found that you know, very interesting to when you're designing force yourself to look at things from different perspectives because you you are going to see different potentials and one viewpoint or one perspective may not be adequate um there's one thing that i i, I found interesting and it's actually something that i've been struggling with myself and and I thought, you know, maybe in a, in a future book, it would be interesting to look at, he uses an example of light as having, or as being described with properties of, as a wave and properties as a particle. And he, you know, he refer, makes that refer, references that as a paradox. And I, I've been thinking about this myself and it's a paradox to us because we don't understand. But maybe light is not a paradox. We just don't understand how something can demonstrate from our perspective wave properties and particle properties. If we had a different level of understanding, this may not be a paradox. And so that might be an interesting concept to explore in a future book, which is when you have, when you encounter paradoxes that can't be explained easily, it may be due to our limited understanding. And it's just that we don't understand at a more fundamental level. And the, and the paradox would then go away. But I did like his perspective there of looking at things from different viewpoints, from different standpoints so that you can see the same object, but from a different um, perspective. So I, yeah, I really enjoyed the chapter. Wonderful. Um, the two of the points that you talked about, uh, CJ has talked about in great amount of depth. Uh, one is the power of multiple perspectives. Uh, he has done a whole bunch of uh, meetups on that and actually, the next time he's going to be here, he's going to be talking about mathematics and handling of ambiguities and paradoxes, uh, how mathematics uh, does it. So um, oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for those observations. Next up is Joe, Marisa, and Mike. Anybody else who wants to share what they got from the chapter, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Joe. Yeah, so there is a lot to be, you know, taken that you can take away from this chapter i mean it's a it's a long chapter i find it uh to be one of the most important ones in the book um but 
one of the things that really spoke to me is, and it kind of gets to what David had mentioned with the idea of having multiple perspectives uh, in the model that it is, uh, I think it's uh, 3.7, mm -hmm. um, that I thought was ex you know, very well done. And then in the sense that uh, it talks about a technical approach, the organizational approach, and then the personnel and personal approach. Um, and, and I've actually seen this quite a bit, like where you have a, um, a, uh, a technical approach, which is just these simplified abstractions that people use. And let's just say they're metrics mm -hmm. that people use and that they manage themselves to that actually don't necessarily indicate what's going on on the ground and in reality within an organization. And that happens quite a bit. Um, that happens, uh, uh, you know, where you're looking at one of the, well, I can go through an example, but let me go through the three perspectives first. Uh, the second perspective is based on how an organization looks at um, basic processes uh, rather than actually the product that they're working with. And this actually works in very nicely with the digital versus analog uh, narrative in the chapter as well. And then there's the person aspect of things where you're actually on the ground and you're actually the result in doing the work from these three other two uh, uh, other two categories. But so from from the technical perspective, I've been in situations where they look at these metrics and they don't necessarily break them apart. So how fast does it take to get something to uh, one of our uh, one of our groups, you know, for purchasing uh, whether it be out of a stock system or they're purchasing from someone else, whatever it may be. Uh, but sometimes they don't necessarily break down the information and actually look at why certain things get to one place faster versus another. They just look at the total number and they don't, they so they're missing the, the real whole of what they're, they're trying to assess. And so, uh, you know, we're, there's there's one specific instance where we were we were measuring how quickly an engine and a stapler we were measuring them the same as to how fast they got to our customers, and and obviously one means more than the other, and this kind of distorted the whole view of what we are actually doing. So that, that was an, an example where you're just using metrics and you're saying, hey, this looks great. We're really, we're doing things really fast, but you don't look at actually what you're actually doing. Um, so I think that that's a very important point. The other aspect of it was where you look at business processes as opposed to what your, the product itself. And that's, and that kind of flows into the previous example where you're, you're looking at, um, you know, people create business processes in order to get something done. And it's interesting because they don't ask the, the critical questions that the authors, you know, pose, uh, you know, does something need to be done and who needs to do it? And all, a lot of times what they do is they involve people and, and, organ, and even groups into a process that they have no business of actually participating in. But it all comes from the question of, you're just looking at the process, but you're not really asking the question as to why you're doing something in the first place. So this automatic, you know, this has resulted in, and I've seen this firsthand as well, to people on the ground coming up with their own perspectives on how to answer the problem. So take the example of how the stapler or the engine gets there even faster. Well, then they just come up with these their own way of trying to get something from point A to point B based on their own prioritization system that people have come up with, but the policies and processes that don't necessarily support them. So that they're, it's, it's a workaround. It reminds me of somebody that used to uh, live in the Soviet Union. <laughs> and they used to tell me how they were in the bread lines and essentially, they, yes, there was a process to get it and, and how you would actually get the food out, out of, you know, from, uh, from when you're purchasing it. But 
you had to be really, the people on the ground were really innovative in circumventing that process and how to actually get the food to themselves. So it, it was just an interesting, um, I, I found that model itself very, very interesting. And I really liked the ethical, economic, and political addition to that model, because that is something that you get that gets ignored. Uh, sometimes when you go in and try and change something, there are political and there are both economic reasons as to why that may not occur. So you have to be aware of those two things. And you always need to ask whether your actions are ethical. Um, so that was, I mean, I felt that model it, in it of itself was actually very helpful if you're doing something on organizational change to really kind of look at the whole that you really need to kind of take a lot of different perspectives. You need to look at it from technical process, but then you need to look at it from the, the, uh, uh, the uh, um, organizational perspective, but then you need to look at it from the individual perspective. And many times when they go in to do organizational change, you know, people that do it right usually have somebody on the, you know, analyzing the personal perspective, but they're also analyzing the technical and, and, and the uh, um, organizational. So I've seen that done correctly very few times, but anyway, so that that's my major takeaway from the chapter. There's a lot, uh, there are a lot of other things, how this really actually flows into the digital and analog aspect of things that I've talked about in the past. But anyway, that's uh, my takeaway. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next up is going to be Maritza, Mike, and Charles. Maritza. So I'm, I'm going to actually switch from where I was going to start just really quickly because I want to piggyback off of um, what Joe was saying. For me, the, this, you know, I, I'm, I love the idea of embracing the concept of multiple perspectives. So the most striking thing, so for those of you who did read the chapter, you'll note that there, there's like, it's like four or five pages or even a little more spent just on this concept and of building this model, the design palette, the palette of particulars. And as Joe mentioned, you know, the addition of additional categories. But to me, in all these pages, there's like one or two lines that are the most important that I really think we should remember. And we're told that we're not being given a list of categories to take and go off and now be done. And it's, and, and it's stated, the reason that it was striking to me is that the authors are very careful to ensure that it's stated more than once in these couple pages. And the reminder is, this is not an exhaustive set that we're providing. We've provided some that may be deemed more common, perhaps more useful for a more general set of situations, but by no means is this the only list. As the designer, you have to choose which are the categories. There's an important facet here and it's judgment. Judgment is what is going to shape the way your graph is going to look. And I thought that that was the most important takeaway. And it reminds me, so I'm going to go now, it reminds me of the, where we were discussing the whole. So um, CJ did a, um, he did a, a, a chat here, a discussion on, you know, he called it the whole shebang. And really I struggled. I struggled with the concept that the way I would get to the whole was by starting with the whole, investigating the parts, and somehow ending at the whole again. And I'm like, no, once I broke it, it's broken. That doesn't work. And it wasn't until the design way that it clicked for me. This chapter, it's chapter four in the book, it's um, the whole. I understood what they were saying. It's, it's this shift in perspective. I mean, you're not literally breaking it. You're just sidestepping. It's like the diagram that David spoke about. If you look at it from one angle, it's the letter G. From a different angle, it's the letter E. That's what we're being encouraged to do with every aspect of items that we're designing. And in, in the um, chapter, the whole, we, we're told, you know, it says, although it's true that the whole is greater than some of its parts, we must also acknowledge that the whole is of those parts. This idea has important consequences, namely, you cannot design a whole without taking into consideration the selection of parts or elements for inclusion on the design palette. So 
if we were reading in the order that we've been reading here together, you may not have entirely understood what was meant by design palette. So now we have a very good idea of what's, what is meant there. It's this idea of the 3D viewing of our um, thinking process here with all the categories included. And he says, you cannot conceptually or concretely impose a whole onto parts. It is not possible to design a whole and impose that emergent quality onto parts that cannot belong in a whole in the whole of priority. The whole takes its emergent essence from the nature of its parts. There is an inseparable relationship between the parts and the whole. We also need to remember that any whole is always part of something more comprehensive, another whole. And you know, the, the term whole, you know, they're used kind of to imply, you know, an understanding here of a relationship. And the fascinating thing is now when you're looking at systemics, we're told that, again, we're, we're reminded how a designer formalizes the types and categories of the systems he or she is working with is up to them. It is a design judgment and therefore a matter of choice. Now, when we get back to choice, that one, we're coming down, we're, it's weeks, so it's only so many times I can bring up my favorite word again. Here it goes. So choice leads us to this concept of intent and intention, right? Because if you're making the decision, if you're using your judgment, there's intent there. And it gets even more beautiful here because in this chapter, we're introduced to the concept of stance. And David brought it up in in when he was speaking here uh, a little bit. And I would like to expand a little bit because he did speak about the idea of um, the standpoint and stance. And here, what I thought was fascinating is that we're, we're shown how, I'm sorry, I, I got excited and lost my page. Mm. Right, so, so we're, we're told that our mindsets determine the stance or standpoint we take towards understanding and acting in the world, all right? If you get stuck only in the design process, you're not actually making anything. The goal, the ultimate goal, right, is to create that which does not yet exist. That's what we're aiming for. We want to come at the end of this process with something. So it requires action. And you don't want to just let things unfold because they got out of control you would like to move forward with intent. And here, the beautiful phrase, meaning making, comes into play. And but before, we, before we get there, stance is explained in this lovely detail. And it's, we're told that stance is a seminal concept in systemic design. It says intention, aim, direction, bearing. These are all bound up with this concept of stance. And it says it's a matter of paying full attention in a particular way. So that means that all these other concepts we've been looking at here together, service, imagination, these all are rolled up into this stance because you make a judgment, you have this intention to move forward and when you make another judgment and another one, your intent becomes the path, right? And that path, that's the stance you're taking. There's a million different ones you can take. You're taking this one. That's your stance. And that's your aim. Because again, what you want is something at the end. And this is how you're getting there. And the, the reason for pointing this out is because without meaning, why bother? The reason that you need intent and you need a stance is because what comes out in the end, it should be meaningful to you, even if it's not of meaning to anyone. If we, if we look at this from a perspective of we ourselves are designing our little lives, and maybe it's something very small. Maybe you're trying to figure out how you're going to design your way into affording a house. Seems like a small example, but you have this desiderata, you are making this plan and you have to take a stance. So it's like, I love Thai food, but it just so happens I order from my Thai food place 
One person, it's $40. If I do that every day, the stance I'm taking is that Thai food is more important than house saving. And that seems silly, but it adds up. And, and you, by not thinking and only just, you know, that instant, I want Thai food, I want Thai food. You are now taking the stance without intent. So the product you have at the end, maybe a little bit more calories. It's not, it's not the meaningful result that would have come about with the action of, in that case, it would have been a action of restraint or action of I'm going to eat in, I'm going to choose a different place because I want to put these $20 here towards this savings. Um, and, and so what I hear in this, this the systemics, the, the, the idea is that we have to look at the before, the during, and the after as we make decisions. Because again, that decision for Thai food in that moment, it sounds like the best decision if you don't consider what comes next. What's going to look like, you know, where do you, what is this going to leave you? And I mean, I know that's an oversimplified example, but I really do believe that that example can be applied to just about anything. It takes us back to the concept that we've explored in previous chapters where we're um, reminded that everything we do touches other factors. None of us live in a vacuum. In fact, it's actually explicitly stated in this chapter, the idea that, um, let's see if I have it here. That no design exists in a vacuum. Designers and their design activity do not live within a vacuum either. So, so we, I know that systemics sounds like this really dry and just like overthought out process for some people, but it's really just a very simple concept. And it's just that concept that if you want that meaningful result, you must take the time at the beginning, in the middle, in the, you know, the, the second, third, and the third, you know, because doing so, taking that time beforehand will allow you the room for finding the meaning. And it's, it's when, we're, when they're talking about the systemic, they're saying, you know, design processes are also not just one or the other. Here in this chapter, I really do love that it's a convoluted way of saying it, but it's saying what we say a little bit in so many of our discussions. Let's try to get away from either or. Let's look at yes and integration, because that's what we're being told here. It, you know, the, the chapter says that everything in the real world is connected to everything else with varying levels of criticality and intensity and connections. And so what does that mean? It means that, again, you, nothing's in a vacuum and you have to assume that something you're touching, it might touch you back in a way you might not expect. How do we prepare for this? There's a, um, there's a concept in Stoicism where you go through the exercise of imagining the worst that could happen so that when the worst does happen, you're now prepared. It comes to you as less of a shock and you're less thrown emotionally because you took the time beforehand to consider the worst that could potentially happen. So now because you perceived it as a potentiality, you are not caught super surprised, never having considered that as a possi possibility. That's what systemics, at least, what I'm understanding, that that's what systemics does for the designer. If you take and you try to imagine the possible outcomes, you won't be caught flat-footed. Um, there's one more thing, and then I promise I'll shut up. I'm, I just, 
I really, there, there's the idea here of analog and digital. And it's very briefly mentioned, but it's so powerful. Um, we're reminded, first of all, that analog is used for the natural. Um, and the, the map, it's again, it's this highlighting of let's embrace the yes and as opposed to the either or. And the reach back, we did a whole series here um, with the digital life sensor and the same powerful message that we spent, you know, like eight sessions deep diving into, it's stated here in like two paragraphs, but they are amazing paragraphs. It's this concept where it, there's homage paid to the progress of sliding from analog to digital and the value that can be found there with one small admonition that we need both. And that when you find yourself here, remember that this still exists and reach back. Try to tie them together because then you have more well-rounded view. And in other words, we wanna get back to the whole. We cannot stay looking at the parts. And if you fail to acknowledge the analog, which is the natural, well, now you're no longer quite looking at the whole. And one more beautiful thing we were told is that when you're looking at a whole, remember that there is a bigger hole that encompasses the hole that you're looking at. And I just think that that's lovely. Thanks guys. Well, uh, Maritza, I know you want to stop talking, but could you please read those two paragraphs? Oh, sure. Yes. No, no, I, I, I could talk forever. I just think, you know, a lot of other people who want to talk. <laughs> this chapter, I have a lot of highlighted. <laughs> Just a moment here, apologies. Uh, folks, uh, next up is going to be uh, Mike, Charlie, Evanique, and Marco, but I can't wait to hear these two paragraphs again. So sorry, so sorry, guys. Take your time. I think it's hiding from me. Oh no. I'm in, I'm in the wrong chapter. I'm in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> Operator error. How about this, uh, Maritza? Let, let Mike go. And then as soon as Mike is done, you can go ahead and read those two paragraphs. Perfect, yes. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Yeah, so I agree. There was so much to take away uh, from this chapter, but I, uh, I actually used it to solve a real world problem, something I've been struggling with recently. And um, what led me to solving the issue was focusing on, uh, which was a clear uh, warning, a reductionist warning from the authors that uh, very similar to what uh, Maritza was saying that you have to be very careful analyzing the parts independently. And in my world as a teacher, um, I, I'll give you a very concrete example of what we would do with young teachers in error. Uh, sometimes is that we would take a block of time say they had to teach a one hour class and we would break the time up as follows. One chunk would be get there 20 minutes early. And then we would say, the kids are gonna be eating lunch while you're teaching, give a 20 minute lecture, 35 minutes, watch them play. So I'm a chess teacher, but you could substitute any discipline. You could be teaching anything, right? Watch the kids play for 35 minutes, five minutes of cleanup and go home. The problem with that is if you're an inexperienced teacher, you're gonna look at those blocks of time independently and just say, okay, I have to, you know, my boss is telling me I need to get to the school 20 minutes early. Then I need to lecture for 20 minutes while the kids are eating, supervise play, and they're just going through the time in chunks. What you're not telling the students is how all of those chunks of time get combined and the purpose for those individual chunks. So for example, why do you wanna to get to a school 20 minutes early? Because frankly, you don't wanna be stuck five minutes away from the school in traffic having to pee. Now that sounds a little strange, but if you're a teacher and you're adjunct and you're going from school to school and you're five minutes away from a school in traffic, you do not want that to happen because that angst that you feel having to get into the classroom, the kids are gonna sense that in a second. So if you're there 20 minutes early, 
you get to know who the crossing guards are. Because if you're doing something at lunchtime or after school, there's always a crossing guard at the school. Now, why is it important to know their name? Because the easiest thing to do to, with a crossing guard is talk about the weather, right? Now, how does that help me as a teacher? Because I'm a jokester and I'm gonna say something pithy to the crossing guard and he or she's gonna say something back to me and it's gonna put a smile on my face. So when I get to the door, rather than having this angst from driving and all this traffic, not only am I early, but I just had a nice little chit chat with the crossing guard. The school that I was teaching, and I, I went through these step by step with a colleague. Uh, there was a security guard that was hired when the school security really tightened up. Uh, this guy was an ex Marine and an ex cop, and now he's security at an elementary school. Now, why is this important? Because if I show up two minutes to go, he's not letting me through without my license, without checking the background. I could say to him, Paul, look, I'm in a hurry. I've got kids waiting. He goes, I don't care. You're not getting through the school. So again, what does that do? It creates the angst. But if I get there early, I get to know him right away. I know the time. I know he's doing his job. So I'm ready. I have my license out and I get through smoothly. Before I wait in the hall for my class, I go into the office. And when I'm in the office, I stick my head in the principal's room and I'll say a joke like, who do I have to talk to to get a raise? Principal gets a laugh. I get a laugh. There is a bathroom in the office. I use the bathroom. I come out and I have 10 minutes before the class starts. Now, if I just tell a brand new teacher, get there early, they have no idea what to do with those extra 10 minutes. But during this one school, I was there five days a week. So what happens is during those 10 minutes, other kids that I teach on different days of the week are walking through the hall. Sometimes they're running. And I'll say, I'm going to give you a ticket if I catch you running again. So what's happening is I'm getting to interact with all of these students, right, with the staff that's in the hall. Then when I finally get into the classroom, I have time to be with the teacher. This is long before the students get to the class. Those five extra minutes that we tell the student, uh, the student teacher to keep, those five minutes are meant to leave the classroom cleaner than it was when you found it. Because if you leave the, the incoming teacher, the mainstream teacher with a messy room, the next time you come into that classroom, you're gonna hit a brick wall with that teacher. They're gonna be really pissed off. So rather than have them mad at me, the fact that they're coming back to a really clean room, what happens is every step along the way, we're creating flow, starting with the crossing guard through the security guard, to the office, to the interaction in the hallway, and then ultimately to the teacher in the classroom. Now, the problem that I solved, I haven't been in a classroom in almost two years because of COVID. And I've had this great angst uh, for um, next Tuesday, I'm finally going back to the classroom. And I don't have the normal butterflies. This is different. Like every teacher in September feels a little something, 10 minutes in, you're back to normal. But this is different. And what I realized what I was doing, and this is, this is what the author warned about, is I was looking at what's coming, breaking it up only in chunks of time. I have new auto insurance because of COVID to park in the property. I have to get there a certain amount of time early, right? I'm gonna be wearing a mask. I don't know who the security guard is. And in my mind, I just kept projecting and I'm teaching in the faculty room. I'm not even in a classroom. And I kept realizing, where is this angst coming from? I read this chapter and I realized I caught myself. I was breaking down the chunks of time without one iota of a connection with the people attached to those times. I read the chapter, I sat back and I just created a list of steps that I have to take, the people that I have to get to react with and how it's gonna work out. Like Maritza said, nothing is guaranteed, I have no idea, but the fact that I was able to pull what I was doing wrong from the chapter really, really helped. So I'll give you a report next Tuesday, let you know how, that, how it goes. Wow, that was wonderful, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. These are just incredible presentations. You know, Maritza making 
all these points and you taking this one example and showing, you know, what, what this can just incredible. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Marisa reading her precious two paragraphs followed Hi. by, uh, followed by, let's see, who is it? Uh, Charlie, Maritza. Okay, so I think technically it's three. Don't hold that against me. Right. <laughs> All right, so despite a recent coining of the phrase the di digital age to mean our current and immediate past history, the Western world has actually been digital for the last 750 years. Time, space, and energy have all been divided into packets or abstract forms of information, which prove to be very stable over time. These packets provide information only when they are in a correct relationship with each other. Regardless of the amount of information these packets can provide, it is important to realize the relationships themselves provide meaning. Thus, the division of the day into hours, minutes, and seconds meters the passage of time without saying what kind of a day it was. A mapping grid demarcates traffic patterns and real estate, but does not delineate the human qualities of neighborhoods, communities, or hometowns. Electrical impulses may be digitized forms of energy, which can convert into digital modes of communication, but they cannot translate the message they are sending. Much of modern life is experienced as a fractured and stressful whirlwind. The lack of integration between analytically designed systems and our own analog life experience can be seen as the primary reason for current levels of angst and yearning in individuals. There seems to be a growing longing for a more integrated, meaningful, and holistic life experience. The challenge for designers is to take advantage of the benefits of the analytic in their design approaches, while at the same time integrating these elements into an overall compositional approach, which draws from the analog. Every new design introduced into the world becomes an analog contribution to the human experience rather than superficially attached, meaningless stuff or worse, junk. Design can be served by the analytic and the digital, but every design process must finish out as an analog composition in order to fit back into the human experience. Thanks. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Maritza. I wanna make one comment. Um, we had several lectures of, uh, by people who were scholars on Walter Onk. He talked about, he talks about orality and literacy. Writing is digital, speaking is analog because it has the whole person behind it. Writing by its nature is sequential and you have to make your mind I go like this in order to grasp things. What we are doing here in the meetups with this book is a very good example of the dance between the digital and the analog. Reading is digital. We are trying to take something which is digital, which was originally analog, you know, which is you know, the author's understanding streamed out in these words. But for them to be really powerful, you kind of, you have to turn them into an analog where they can live through you. And this process of having a conversation about it from these multiple perspectives actually brings out what has been achieved digitally. Uh, that's the best way and we are actually exchanging this analog with each other, and then we can turn it into our own writing, our own, um, own skills, build that apart, make that a part of us, and then produce our works. So thank you. Uh, thank you for highlighting that, uh, Marisa. I really appreciate that. Next up is uh, Charlie, Evanique, Marco, and Allison. Charlie. 
Uh, yeah, as, as I suppose no one will be surprised, I'm going to take a kind of a philosophical approach to this. Um, uh, the um, history of science, okay, started off with this idea of particularizing, okay? And so with uh, Newton, he started off with point masses. And then from that idea of, of breaking things down into a separate independent pieces called point masses, he developed a whole theory of mechanics, okay? And, uh, and, and, and I'm not gonna go into the details of you know, what, what that is, but basically the idea is, is it's like a machine. Once you know what the parts are and you know where they're located and everything, you can predict what's gonna happen and you can be in control, okay? Prediction, control. OK, so you get into a psychological um, uh, appreciation of what's going on. OK, so if a person is really kind of has this obsession with prediction and control, they're going to feel very comfortable in this world. OK, well, now around the end of the 19th century, Ludwig von Boltzmann comes along and he uh, deals with this problem of complexity. OK, because when you have a whole bunch of particles, you're trying to solve that system of ordinary differential equations, just forget about it. You're not going to do it. It's too complicated. And so how do you deal with that? And so he came up with this idea of statistical ensembles, OK, that you would look at these ensembles of, of in, in what is called phase space, which is a space of all possible configurations of, of particles and their, and their velocities in a vector sense. And, uh, and, and uh, the scientific establishment at that time tore him to pieces. So much so that he committed suicide because they were fixated on this machine way of thinking, prediction, control. But all of a sudden he comes along with this idea of statistics and all of a sudden the idea of, of prediction and control starts, starts to kind of get, get feeling like it's starting to slip away from them. And, uh, it, it, and so uh, the thing is, is, is that it became much worse with quantum field theory because that came along and, and, and the, the concept with what's, what, what's called the Born rule uh, it, is that the understanding was that, that there is such a thing as objective uh, probability, you know, that, 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 the, that you know, as, as Einstein complained, you know, God does not play dice with the universe, but you know, it turns out he was wrong. And, uh, and so this whole idea of prediction and control, this obsession, okay, that has that has been part of Western civilization for so long. It's really starting starting back with uh, Plato, where, where where you wanted to you know have the, uh, the the Platonic forms and so on, and wanted to break things down into into these pieces from which you could build things up. Now, the systems point of view, it just goes the other way around, okay. And, and Einstein knew about this. He 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 he, he distinguished what, what between what he called a principle theory and a constructive theory. A constructive theory is where you have your pieces predefined before you start, and then you say what are the relationships between these pieces, and that tells you how you can build up the the whole from the parts. But the other one says, no, I don't, you know, the things are just too complicated, and I'm going to look for principles by which the system works, okay. Well, uh, uh, in the uh, 90s, uh, uh, Gelman, uh, Murray Gelman, uh, uh, the person who won a Nobel Prize for his work on quarks, uh, realized that, uh, that, that understanding um, life was never going to happen using that approach, which is like coming up, coming up with a, an equation that describes the state of a system, a finite system, okay? And uh, before that, you know, it was like the complexity was understood in terms of entropy and, and Komolgorov was in the 1930s was a person who developed a, a mathematical theory of probability. But uh, the, then, you know, the question is, well, you know, how does computation, because computation started being developed with Turing and his Turing machine. And, and, and so another concept that we are looking at at complexity is, is can you compute it? Okay, is this, is this a number that you can actually write a program and compute it? So you had these two notions of complexity. One is, is that it's unlikely. It's a very unlikely event. So, so that, that uh, something that would be infinitely complex would be something that is, is, has close to zero probability or actually zero probability. And uh, the other one is that uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the Turing computer uh, program would be infinitely long. It would never end, okay? Uh, that would be another definition of, of complexity. And so you'd measure how long does it take to compute something. And, uh, and, and so... But this, what, what's happened with, with, uh, with, with systems theory, uh, especially complex adaptive systems that came out of the Santa Fe Institute with Murray Gelman, is that if you allow for the possibility that, that, that your individual uh, uh, elements, so to speak, in the system have the ability to choose, okay, like living systems do, uh, unless you believe in determinism, uh, then uh, you end up with a system that you can not predict and you cannot control. Okay, 
uh, in the sense of total prediction and total control. You can have an influence, but you know, this is one of the things that has come out of the um, uh, the the um, uh, the EPA um, uh, environmental impact reports that people cannot predict what's going to happen when you make changes to the environment because the environment will interact with what you do in an unpredictable fashion. And, and, and so that uh, this idea, this obsession with prediction and control that, that people have been stuck with going back to Plato uh, is, is something that, that is kind of a mental illness, really, you know, and, and it's, it's, a, it's an unwillingness to, uh, it's this idea that people are gods, okay, and that they're the Superman, and, and that they're going to go out and they're going to run everything, okay, they're going to be the ruler, they're going to be the, the decider, and, uh, and, and, and uh, it's just, it's kind of, you know, it's a sick way of thinking, whereas the system's idea says, well, let's have some humility into, you know, the system's going to do what it's going to do, and we're going to do what we're going to do, and, and can we learn how to dance together, you know, it's kind of like jazz music or something like that, it's like an art form and uh and so that's kind of how i see it and, and uh um it, it helps me get through the world you know i kind of have some humility that, that knowing that that i i'm, I'm not going to be in control and uh and, and i try not to make mess things up too much when i do interact thank you I, I don't often accomplish that i i, I mess <laughs> things up more than i would like <laughs> thank you uh thank you charlie uh thank you for bringing bringing this point up i mean uh and i really like appreciate your you know, the kind of historical and scientific perspective and um, kind of, you know, tracing the history of how, how did we get here? So this is just wonderful. Thank you. Next up is Evanique, Marco, and Allison. Evanique. All right, sorry, I was having problems on Ely. Um, one thing I was thinking of when everybody was talking is this concept of evaluation and it's throughout this chapter, but really evaluating a system to see if it's operating the way you need it to operate. And I say that, and I'll use an example just to make it make sense. So when I was at JLT, we were in charge of the contracting process in our department, but it had to work for several different systems. It had to, or departments, but we, there are systems. I had to work for the legal department. It had to work for the brokers. I had to work for the accounting team and it had to work for the claims team. And each had a different function. It each was a different system in and of itself, but together we had to come together and make it work. So one of the things that we had to do is we had to evaluate and like this chapter did bring some PTSD to me because I remember creating this system um, and it was not fun. Um, it was interesting, but it was, it was hard. Um, but we had to keep evaluating to see if it was working, A, the way it was designed to work and more importantly, B, the way we needed to work. So I think when we were, when the chapter talks about creating meaning, I look at it as like, what is the design supposed to do? And why are we doing this? Like, why are we putting all this work into a system? And for the answer of my job was to make the contract system work for everybody where everybody could reach the contract in the same place where only certain people had the ability to edit that way down the road, there wouldn't be any problems with the contract. So you had to have a limited set of people that could actually edit that contract, but you needed people that could also view the contract without having to come to the legal department. So um, evaluation was key in getting that done. And I think uh, something Maritza said is judgment. Uh, when she was talking about judgment and meaning making, I was thinking of that, like, like you have to make a judgment call as to if it's working. And at several points in this, system creating this system we had to say to ourselves is this worth it like is this worth the time the money the effort the energy that we were spending and at every point in that process we had to say yes at every point for each system each department it also had to work so I thought about that and so I kind of wish I had this book when I was creating that system because it would have Help me to see, because I was looking at the um, 3.7, the one that Joe had mentioned, 
And when it was talking about all these different aspects and I'm like, gosh, that's so true. Like it was political, it was economic, like all these systems had to come in together as one. And I think if we realize that like the system is so funny because you think of the system as this one big thing and you don't think of it as many systems within it. But this book, what the chapter really does really well is it points out there's all these other different systems that come together and make the whole. And the simple fact that the whole comes, the chapter on the whole comes right after this is beautiful and perfect and flows because I think some people would think of the system as the whole, but I think the whole is a whole bunch of different systems. And so that's, those were my thoughts on it. And oh, one more thing. Um, at several points in the process, we had to discuss what we were willing to sacrifice. So at some point we were realizing when you don't realize that certain parts don't work, you have to, like, we had to think about, well, what are we willing to sacrifice in order to get to the goal or the meaning? And in some instances, like we had to sacrifice as legal, uh, the ability, like we didn't want anybody to edit our contracts, right? Like we wanted no one to have access to the word copy, everybody get a PDF. In reality, that just didn't work. Like if somebody wanted to make a quick correction to a contract. So what we came up with was, uh, basically certain people, brokers and legal could have ability to edit, but legal could be the only one to finalize the contract and get it ready for signature. And that's what it is. It's like, you have to sacrifice, you have to look at, and you have to get out of yourself too, because even though it's your design, if it doesn't work for other people, what's the point, right? Are you losing the meaning by holding on so tightly to what you design and being rigid about it. I think this book allows, I mean, this chapter allows you to be flexible, actually the whole book, but the chapter allows you to be flexible with that. So those are my thoughts. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Evanique. I wanna follow up on one comment, uh, the comments of uh, Charlie. I mean, one of the simplest ways I've seen is to move to biology, you know, get, inspiration from living things. You know, we did a meetup on uh, the gut microbiome over the weekend. And if you wanna understand the gut microbiome, you have to respect it as a system, as a living thing. You can't just throw antibiotics at it, which will kill everything in there, good, bad, ugly, everything. Uh, and it will have consequences. So I think, you know, living system in many ways, kind of Western medicine versus Eastern medicine, uh, you can see the difference of, you know, trying to respect the whole being and trying to work at it at that level, rather than trying to solve this one problem through uh, almost like a billiard ball kind of approach. Um, thank you. Next up is going to be Marco followed by Alison. Marco. Um, yeah, I, I thought that chapter was like really great on um like I, i've been meaning to like uh try to understand like systems thinking in general and you know it was like it was a nice surprise to you know it was uh, i really learned a lot um but like one of the most like um like a the powerful like metaphor that um that i really liked was um the the metaphor of the like dissecting a frog that basically like you have, you know, you could take apart a frog, but, you know, and you can sort of like analyze each and every part, but if you put it back together, like, you know, it's still gonna, it's, it's still gonna be dead. <laughs> like, so you're kind of like, you know, missing that part. So basically, I guess it's just, you know, driving home the point of just this, you know, that um, a, a system is not just a, a, a is not just parts, but it's a it's the whole. It's the 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 whole entity that um, that makes brings it together. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, Marco. Uh, next up is going to be Allison. Um, so what I was thinking about with this systems idea is that if you have 
if you take any kind of an art, whether it's a painting or dance or a piece of music, you have all these different parts of it, and then but they all relate together into one whole. And um, and every piece of art is like that, absolutely all of them. But the different parts aren't identical, but they complement each other and they work to create a unified whole. The problem with this, I once you leave the art world and the design world is that it doesn't work like that out in the real world. And I feel like what happens generally is you see people swinging from one extreme to the other. So either um, people have, either you have a real top down, everything has to be this way. And it's, it's like, you know, like McDonald's, you walk in every McDonald's looks the same, but you're not getting something really good. Um, and the problem with that is that yes, it's unified, but it completely stifles people's creativity. And then the other example is when everything is so diverse, everyone can do whatever they want to, but it doesn't really function because it's not part of a whole. Um, and I think, you know, we see a lot of, I, I mean, I think what's kind of interesting when you look at the history of this country is that um, before the constitution, we had, um, you know, the constitution was created because what was it that I, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it I know the uh, articles uh, of confederation that's what it is yeah the articles of confederation was too loose and it gave the states too much power and there wasn't enough of a, a federal power so they got rid of it got the constitution so that we have more of a unified power but nowadays when you look at the pandemic a big problem is that it's not unified because everyone's doing each state's doing their own thing so we see the weakness in not having enough unified control. So I, mean, I think it's just a hard balance to find, but when you look at the art world, anything that succeeds as a piece of art, all of this works or it doesn't succeed. So, uh, you know, it's just finding that middle balance, you know, the middle way, I guess it is. Wonderful, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Alison. So folks, now we are going to go uh, with um, Jeng's presentation and, um, after the breakout rooms, we'll continue with questions because this is a very deep chapter. There's a lot of concepts. I want people to bring up questions that we have not uh, discussed. And while you're listening to Jeng's presentation, use pen and paper to keep track of your questions. So when you come back, we can have a great uh, Q&A, the lightning round start. Uh, give me just a second. Let me make Chang the co-host so she can share her screen. Uh, go ahead, Chang. Uh, okay. Chang, you need to unmute. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, I have to apologize. I haven't finished the slide, but I think everybody already shared so much. And I think this chapter, I, uh, I, I don't know why, but the, um, the PowerPoint is very mm -hmm. small. It's not looking large. I don't know whether, is anybody else having the problem? Just let me know. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's uh, small. That's weird. Okay, uh, I think maybe it's my new screen. Now it's bigger screen, so maybe it's only showed as uh, one one third of the screen. Yeah, yeah the large screen. So uh, let me see if we can uh, redo it. Sure. Yeah, new technology. <laughs> That's what you. Okay, let me do this. Did I put it here? Is that better? Uh, let me see. Uh, you, you're not sharing at this point. Uh, can you go ahead and try sharing? Is that better? Uh, 
let, can you hit uh, present? Uh, let me see. Uh, I think you need to hit present or something. Slideshow. Uh, I already showed. Oh, it's already there. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Uh, folks, uh, play around with your. Uh, there is a sliding Working. scale that you can use. It's it's a little bit better, but uh, still not perfect. But that's all right. We'll we'll go with this. Okay. okay. We'll go with yeah. it. We can fix it. Sorry about that. Yeah. New no problem. Technology. Uh, yeah, folks, so uh, 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 let me just uh, tell people, uh, folks, you can, there is a side-by-side -side view that you can use and you can make Jeng look very, very small. So her presentation looks very, very large. There is a way of doing that. All right. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jeng. Okay. Okay. System thinking. Yeah. So this, uh, this, this chapter actually is pretty, uh, quite interesting. I learned a lot from this chapter. And, um, and the interesting thing is very long and complicated chapter, but somehow, you know, it's easy to understand. You know, a lot of chapter I found is very hard to understand. But this one, somehow it's all start to make sense. Everything come together. So let's go back to the system thinking. So designer needs to see relationships and identify and protect essential connection found in real life by system thinking. So my understanding of sy systemic thinking is actual structure, you know, because I'm architect, I see things all in structure, is the relationship between the things. So I think that's very critical. Designer must be able to create essential relationships. Uh, Jen, and could you forward the slide? I can see only the first, oh. the, the title slide right now. What? I already showed. Uh, let me see. So you, uh, you, you, you can use the slider to take it down. Oh. Right now, it is just showing the first slide. Is it? Is it right now? Yeah. That. Yeah. Now I can see systemic thinking. Is the. Is the okay. Slide. Good. Go good. Okay. So um, system, uh, systemic thinking. Um, so designer must must be able to create essential relationships and critical connections in their design between their design and the larger system. So it's all about relationship. I think, I think, uh, I think system is like, is like structure. It's about the element and their relationship. Be systemic in everything they do and make. So what designer are trying to do, they have to understand the system and they create these things like um, Marisa mentioned, then put back to the system. So be feeding the system. They have to understand it first. So designer pay full attention to essential relationship and critical, uh, critical connections. That's how make the design sustainable. So the design systema uh, systematic is a compound of integ uh, integrative, inclusive, and connected thinking aim at taking right action and doing the right thing, not perfect thing. That's make that's depend on judgment. I think. That's actually helped me understand a designer myself. You know, it's all about action. You understand the world and you make something with it. I think that's that's very different. They mentioned compared to the other understanding interpretation was uh, science. You know, design is about action. Every design is either an element of a system or a system itself. No design designer or design activity, uh, activity is, exists in vacuum embed entanglement of system relationship and connections. So design, you either design a system or you, you design also in a larger system. So you basically you have to understand it, the relationship. The complexity is the nature order of things. So then they talk about designing its interdependent activity involve multiple input from multiple dimension realm of real world. Design inquiry is systematic in nature. And the re then they mentioned the reason because of the nature is so complex. To understand it, we have to create this system, system like structure. So we make sense of all the parts, how they relate to each other. I think that's very critical. That's the reason they need a system because it's so complicated. And we understand it. I think that's my challenge right now uh, with a lot of digital. Uh, world of technology. For example, like we have um, uh, email, 
you know, and Microsoft used to have this email I use very well because it's all based on this, based on the, you know, like the project, you know, then you have all this email you related to the same project. But now everything you have is tag. And it's very confusing. All the email come together and you have search with tag. Before I can find all the email related to my project. It's all related to project. Now I have to tag them somehow. <laughs> I found this, uh, I also mentioned to Shekhan and others, you know, I have this idea about learning tree. You know, the learning tree is the system because we learn so many things, it's all elements. And then, then you don't know how they connect to each other. And you, in order to understand the bigger picture, you need a structure. Otherwise it's just, you understand the parts. And I think the learning tree is also a system, how you understand, how your knowledge connect to each other. And there's the important knowledge, then there's more detailed knowledge as different Zoom. So system approach and system thinking into include system science yeah, are integrated ontology and uh, epistemology approach within system philosophy. System philosophy and design philosophy is inseparable intertwined. Uh, all things are interconnected systemic, uh, systematically to other things. So then, this is kind of, we learned earlier about um, how at Plato's uh, day, like they mentioned how it's separated thinking and acting. And now system actually help us to bring it back, the thinking and acting. System design unifies thinking holistically, this acting courageously, creatively, and responsibly. Sy systematic is a fundamental basis for thinking, uh, design logic and reasoning. That's also very important. And this systematic is actually logical. It's about relationship. It's focused on connection and relations between people, subject, object, and idea. And I think it's very important to have the structure. You know, the structure help it. Like if you have all the knowledge, like, um, like you have all the things in your room. And uh, I know everybody, I, I tried to learn this from very famous Japanese organizer. I can't remember her name, but she's actually teaching how you put all the things in the same location. So you know how much things you have. That's a system she created that help you to better organize all the things you have. Uh, reductive thinking in education working experience focus on elements and categories of elements rather than connection and relationship between among the event and things. I think that's very critical. That's the problem with our current education, I think, because we learn, it's all about the subject. You know, we learn this subject, this subject, and we don't know what's the relationship between them. And I think the project-based learning is actually a system teaching because they teach you to solve a problem. Then from that problem, you realize, oh, I need this knowledge. I learned this knowledge. Now how they I integrate those knowledge together to solve this problem. That's how this knowledge then makes sense to you. Why you learn this knowledge? Because those parts will work together on this project. I think project-based learning is a system. That's why it works so much better. So system denote both the subject means of inquiry and object focus of inquiry. So create a compositional whole to bring together. So system is about the things, you, the inquiry of the object and also about the person who inquiry about it. Motivation for system design inquiry is the desire to know how things intentionally cause to stand together in unity. I think they mentioned a lot about the unity and whole. That's how system help us to understand because it's not about parts, about the relationship between the parts to create this whole. I think that's a very critical concept. System has been used as a description of embodied, uh, embodied way of thinking and a thing that's being thought about. So it's both, both about the thinking and the things you're thinking. System thinking is constituted of system science and system approach, which create meaning making. Relationship of understanding between experience and who experienced it. I thought this part is quite uh, interesting. So that's how we form a matrix of belief system. So we, it's, it's, so that's actually, we learn so much about consciousness. A consciousness is not all psychology. It's not about your experience. 
It's also about you. The two person may experience exactly the same thing, but they have totally different experience because you have different belief system. So inclusive, real, true, and ideal understand of the world inform action, reflection, imagination in specific situation. I think this, I, I found this part is quite fascinating because that exactly about all this training or psychological training or whatever it's about. It's about, you know, it's not about, it's reinterpreting your experience. You know, it's about how change your mindset, your framework, your system thinking, then you see the same experience differently. That's how you change your life. System thinking is both a way of observing the world and a way of being the world. The intention to describe and explain it and take action it. So this is very critical how we function in the world. We see things when they make interpretation. That's why the view they also mentioned later, the world will is so critical because our meaning making or our interpretation of the world is decide our action, how we react to the things happen to us and how we make actions towards our intention. The way people nat naturally interact with the world makes sense out of life. This is the whole reason we are here actually study and have to bring ideas to make a sense of life. We learn all these theories and we try to make sense of what's actually happening in the world and, what's, and we try to make sense what they're talking about, how they related to our real life. Distillation are inherently a natural compound world approach and world will function in a more natural way. So this, this mention about compound, I think that's actually somehow when I read this chapter, it reminded me a lot of, about Dao De Jing somehow, you know, and the reason Dao De Jing works and it works, it just works. <laughs> Every experience I have, I mentioned I lost cell phone today on my ski trip, but like, and I was like, oh, maybe it's not a bad thing. All the good thing and bad thing all come together. So I think the real, the funny part is like, the reason it makes so much sense because it's a compound. It's good and evil, bad, and it's, uh, it's all this together. So then they help you understand every experience so much better. And because it's so concise and it's like poem. So it's actually, it have this, it's not very, somehow it's have all this content in it somehow. Systematic approach offers an alternative to the forced compromise between the narrow specialization and broad shallow generalization. System thinking focus on relationship between domain of knowledge and the pattern of relationship as emerge as consequence. The pat pattern also gave meaning through interpretation. I think this mentioned the system because the system is a structure, you know, so it's not, um, it's not, how do you say? It's not distillation, so it's not simplified. So you can have, that's why you have this house, you have this structure, and then you can have a very decorative wall, or you can have very simple wall, but still the same structure. I think that's how system works. So you have understanding of the structure, even though you, you could zoom into more details, or you could not do, you could not zoom into detail, but you can still have this holistic understanding of the whole thing. The system approach and system thinking form a lens through which observe, imagine, and comprehension, understanding, and action are forced interactively. Same as traditional design. The process of outcome of system thinking are mirrored in design thinking. So system thinking is a lens, how we see the world basically. System all have include design of system inquiry can be represented with concept of system compound. All systematic phenomena are constitute of compound and form. So this mentioned a compound again. So the compound is all these elements come together. Since system thinking and system approach can be characterized as arising from a mix of different traditional approach, system thinking and part of the design query is action oriented. This also mentioned again, it's all about action. You understand the world, understand the systems, the nature of the system we work with, in order to actions, in order to add something into it. System, system, uh, sense system inquiries focus on description and explanation and the formal world will. So that's kind of the sense system design as a world approach. So the 
predominant ontology interesting type of system related concepts such as subsystem meta system. So design, uh, so they mentioned there's uh, this, this, there are two ontology and epistemology design. I actually have a hard time to understand what that means, but they mentioned the ontology is about the type of system. There's the subsystem and meta system. Then they mentioned the later, it's quite fascinating later, is about how we see the world differently. And you have different conflict view of the image of the things, but then you go to a larger system, then they no longer conflicted. So that's called the um, meta system. Then there's a smaller system. So that's why, you know, when you understand the thing, you have this structure, then you can go bigger system or you go to a smaller system. The relationship is all right. So you can understand that's, that's what um, I think uh, Alison mentioned about uh, art and drawing. You know, when I mentioned how the learning pencil rendering helped me so much understand the world in general, because when you draw, you start with this right structure. Then you, you, you develop more details. But the, when you develop details, you always focus on the whole result. You don't focus, I don't finish the eye, then I finish the rest of the eye, then finish the face. I always have the whole head. You know, if I draw a person, then I have developed details as I move in. Maybe I have focused more detail on this, but they always related to each other. I think that's what uh, Addison is mentioned about. It's all about the relationship. So once you have that understand the relationship, you can draw a very detailed person to a single hair on the face, or you could draw a very rough person, but everybody can recognize as a person, no matter how detailed they get into it, into it. The reason is because you have the right structure and right relationship of your face composition. So that's why you can have abstract painting or you can have sketch painting or you can have very detailed painting, but they have, you can understand is this, is the same person. I think that's the beauty about system because they use the system understanding. So that's why you can recognize the same person either you draw a very detailed or you draw very sketchy because the structure is the same, the system is the same. That's my understanding of how these things all come together. Description of system require a lens or defined set of framing categories through which system exempt. So then, uh, Epistemology design category exam is design categories that inclusive real true and ideal framework. Another example is category set inclusive economic, political, and social frame works. This Joe mentioned uh, more than one frame uh, categories used, resulting image can be different, conflict or mutually exclusive to one another, which is very important. I think. That's what Dao De Jing also talked about, you know, how you can have this conflict, the conflict the will, you know, good and evil, you know, in the past. And Plato was talking about you either good or evil. I think that Western thinking is based on this true or not true. So it's very like uh, David uh, Richard mentioned, it's about this extreme, very understanding of the truth. In reality, it's not, it's way more complicated. So that's why the Dao De Jing, maybe it lasts longer. So people understand it better, I don't know. So they understand that the paradox of conflict, they can coexist like the yin and the yang. That's how the, the real world works. It's not just true, right and evil, you know, it's not, it's not as simple as that. Uh, so example, one real world event project into three different frame of reference, economic, pol politic, and social can reveal dramatic different understanding value and meaning. This tension can be mediated through system approach. A new understanding emerge with reconciliation of different between things rather than compromise or trade off. I think this is, this is very critical, you know, because we always, I think people have this uh, rightness. You know, we always want to think they are right, but they, a lot of time they find conflict with other people because they have standing at different point of view. And in order to add think a matured thinker or mature person, you are able to see things through diff from different point of view. Like you under analyze a one event with different perspective, then you can have a 
a more, when you reconcile all this conflict, you can have better understanding of the truth. So how to resolve this conflict? First, dissolve the contextual framework to give rise to the conflict image in the first place by step back into a larger system. Actually, I want to uh, give a real example of this. Uh, we talk about medical system, how we have so much, I have so much trouble with this. Maybe when my kids have allergy, you know, have skin problem, eczema, then the skin doctor gave all this um, bad, you know, lotions for him to repress it, but it doesn't really help. Then they come back all this problem. Then I realized, you know, the Chinese medicine, what they're trying to do, actually they use qi, you know, because when you, our body have so many systems, we have skin system, digest system, all this system. But, but all this system end up is create a human. But we don't understand the key point is how all this system work together. All this system work together through our maybe neural system. But in China, they actually have this qi idea. I think the qi is like you step back. How the qi actually connect all the system, you know, and they work with all the system. That's how acupuncture works. When you use needles, point out like, that's why they said, you have headache. They don't treat your head, they treat your foot. There's a nerve on your foot, one point of your foot. Then they put the needle there, they your head is cured. That's how, how this acupuncture works because they see, see this whole as a system and how the chi connect all, reunited all this system together. So I think that the important thing is we could see a larger system. Then we can dissolve all the conflict. A larger, more unified frame can be constructed that transcend the limitation of our original system's purpose, from which a new understanding of the event emerge in a new, in a different level of, of comprehension. I see this also happening in Western medicine because now we have functioning doctor. What functioning doctor do is actually more holistic, nutrition based. Is very similar to other traditional, like India. I know India also have some kind of traditional medicine, like Chinese traditional medicine. That's what they try to do: treat the body as whole instead of like your skin have problem. I have to get rid of the skin problem. You know, instead of see it's a new as a holistic body. Dealing with complexity without oversimplification. That's very key of the thing. You know, look at one individual system. Treat things in a one system is simplification because you body is a larger system need to deal with. The ability to use systematic design approach is the stance assumed by changing mindset between being evaluative and, and being creative. So the mention, I think Marissa Mont mentioned about stance. Individuals are of many minds, subconscious as well as conscious. Integrate all level of consciousness, challenge is informed out of unconscious mind will develop conscious mind. So this is quite, this I mentioned earlier about this, I read this part, I feel very interesting because it's about the mindset and how, how the mindset works because we have to, we not just dealing with consciousness, we have to dealing with subconsciousness, which we have no control over. So that's why I think they quit meditation, trying to access to it. What we see and how we see ourselves at the world depends on where the position in relationship of what what we observe, the framework. Stance is intentional aim, direction, bearing is bound up in this stance. It's, uh, it's point to first intention, next step, setting a designer along specific paths of inquiry and action. So in the stance is kind of like, it's hard to describe, I don't know. It's, uh, it's kind of like your belief system and all this, so, how this intention you have, then the, that creates certain direction, your intention then lead to the path of your action. Mindset is a set of assumptions held by individual group, guided behaviors. How we create this mental model, uh, model systematic cognitive representation of reality. So this is, you know, kind of quite interesting how we create our belief system. We create this model. Like this is model also what uh, Judah Peterson talked about the map of the world. We create this our own mental model of the world. Then we have to constantly challenge it, correcting it to match with reality. Because this is this our understanding of the world will guide 
our in interaction with the world, create our world view. Then they use this word, which I cannot spell, <laughs> means world view is cognitive framework, a type of schema or mental model that determine what and how things will be focused, filtered, and understand. I think this is very critical. How we understand the world is how we focus, filter, understand. This is our mindset. It's a fundamental set of narrative of how things work in the world, include value, emotional, and ethics. Refer to framework of schema, theories, and belief system through which individual interpret the world and interact with it. So this mindset is so critical. And I think the reason we learn and we do the training, I did the landmark training, which I found very helpful. And I think some people use psychotherapy. It's all trying to help us to expand or change our mindset. Because some people may, because of their ex negative experience, they form this ne negative mindset, which is hard to get rid of. You know, you, some people through learning, maybe they can change it, but others may need outside help to get them out of that mindset and create this more holistic, positive view of the world. Showing evidence of system as isolated separate part is inadequate means of representing system. Yeah, system is not element. It's about relationship. Or describe whole from a singular point of view. Challenge to see the whole of the situation is like the elephant of the blind man story. We all have, we know we have a challenge to see the whole. System insight into complex reality are reviewed by image, distorted with filters such as culture, habits, and expertise. Future limits can be seen, heard, and feel. Like bias and prejudice as common filters. But the filter also helps determine what is foreground and what is background. So this also is kind of yin and yang, you know. What, what's, what's the filter's function? The filter actually is bad, you know, because they have all this bias when they see things. But the reason they have all this bias is because that's human's mind work. They simplify things so we can function easily on the world, in the world. They create a foreground and background. Lens is different from filter that makes things clear rather than narrow, like our glasses. So, um, so they talk about the lens. So then they mention about through different lens, you study point of view, you study a same, same event that help us have more holistic understanding of the event. So uh, this. An example, Harold Linston uh, developed a model of multiple perspective to understand, this is quite interesting, uh, understand any event from te uh, technology events and significant disaster combined this, uh, to have this more rich holistic understanding of the world. Actually, this, even as a person, you know, if a mature person, I, I think the reason to tell is the person is more mature, or if the person is uh, naive, is how if they see the world black and white, or he can see the world more gray. So the mature people can see the world more gray because from different perspectives. So uh, because the world, the reality is complex, the three perspectives, I think Joe mentioned technology, organization, and personal. And then in design, they actually add more lens through it, include politics, economic, ethical, and spiritual perspective to help us to have, to see the design. This also is, it reminded me of, about Anne Ran. You know, Anne Ran, I used to fascinated by her. She has very extreme view of the world and it's very idealistic. And if you read Fountainhead, you know, I used to like the Fountainhead. Well, he's fighting the world to have this true architecture, <laughs> bring it to the world. And the, I watched the movie too, you know, and this guy, you know, I can't remember, he's a famous actor who's like, he would rather work in the quarry instead of compromise his design. You know, it's kind of like the idealist way of the world. Usually, I realize it's not really ideal. You know, the thing is, we educated at architecture school, we always want to create a masterpiece, but it's only from designing, designer point of view. But when you see from the developer point of view, they want is to make you money. And from client point of view, they want to work for themselves with their limited budget. So now I, as a 
practice designer for a long time, now I understand. So I try to make their view works, then trying to steal in my view as well. So I try to fulfill other needs, then I make it better. I say, oh, I give you actual, you know, make your space, space nicer. They're usually happy with that. They don't mind you gave them more. You just want, you gave them what they want first. I think that's critical to understand their view and provide what they need. Warning, aggregation of piece and parts of discipline, their description doesn't reveal a holistic understanding of the whole. So this part is also about the part and the whole. Complex phenomena like real system are impossible to see from one standpoint. Just like building, you need to walk through the building from different stages. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. All right. So uh, give me just a second. I want to make sure everybody can unmute. All right. Um, so what is it that you would like to talk about? Uh, or what is it that, what question about systemics um, that you would like to put on the table? Go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Um, folks, uh, I also want to tell you that uh, Harold Nelson will be back. I'll be interviewing him two weeks from now. I'll be interviewing him on largely two questions, you know, his impressions of our meetups 
and what he sees as the way forward. Those are the only two things that I will be asking him. And I want to leave a lot of time for your questions. And he's very much interested in knowing what questions you have. So take the two weeks to try to come up with the questions that you have. Maximum three questions, okay, for the entire book, maximum three questions, all right? And uh, we will, uh, we will we'll go, uh, we'll go from there, all right? Uh, but today we're doing questions on systemics. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, I'm going to start with Jeng, Charlie, OC, and Kevin. Folks, it's a little late, so please keep your questions brief so we can get to as many questions as we possibly can. Jeng, what's your question? Yeah, so my question is, uh, is the reason of, we discussed this, Marisa and uh, Avinik, the reason we are unaware of the system, is that because our American have such a great social system, so it works so smoothly, so you don't need, you cannot become uh, like what you call the, the nail in the machine that you don't aware of a, a machine anymore. So because you're no longer a designer of the machine. And also is everything a system? I see everything a system right now, like all the politics system, everything. And um, to understand it, and that's the intention, understand the system and designing it to changing it. I think that's the purpose. Is that the purpose of this whole book? You know, so we see everything as a system so we can understand the relationship and, and we, we can improve it. We talk about the politics system, like the great thing about the American system, Donald Trump can be the president and still okay, the country. So that tested is okay. It's a damage test. Thank I have you. to pick up my kids, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Jeng, for that question. Um, I, on, on systems thinking, I strongly recommend anything by ACOF. Akoff is just brilliant, brilliant on this, uh, both videos, books. I mean, you can start with the videos. Uh, we've done some meetups on him, but he's, he's just incredible. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Charlie, O.C. and Kevin. Charlie, what's your question? Yeah, I, I think one uh, uh, question is uh, the central importance of, of a system uh, paying attention to buy-in. In other words, uh, uh, to what extent, if you have uh, agents, you know, free agents uh, who, who can choose, make their own choices, within that type of a system, uh, you, uh, the importance of, of buy-in to the system, in other words, do each of the people in the system uh, uh, feel like their place within the system is a place that they want to be, okay? Excellent. Uh, What's the yeah, importance so of buy-in of of uh of the stakeholders in a system. Wonderful. Next up is OC followed by Kevin. OC, what's your question? Uh, my question is uh, the same question that posed my group. Um, I was just curious if there was a way to uh, create a paradox within a system and the real life uh, situation would be similar to like disrupting the AI, um, you know, where the AI constantly learns, it takes data and it creates a system that is more, um, you know, more technologically advanced and uh, more powerful over time. And how would it be possible to uh, create a paradox within the system that kind of disrupts all the elements within that system? Is there a way to um, logically do that if possible? Wonderful, thank you. Great, great question. Uh, is it possible to create a paradox within a system that disrupts the system? Um, next up is going to be Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. How do you manage the systematic change, the power change? Okay. How do you manage? Uh, so you're saying, how do you manage change of systems? Yeah. Based on the, what we learned today, like this chapter. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. How do you manage? change of systems. All right, let's do, uh, let's see here. Um, paradox, how do you manage change? All right, so let's take first uh, Jeng's question. Um, why is it that we are not aware of many of the systems that we are in? Um, what does it take? Uh, you know, is it because the systems are working very well? 
or is it because they're not working very well? So what, what, what do you think about the, your awareness of the systems uh, that you are operating within? Uh, go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would like to answer. Again, keep the answers brief so we can go through all these questions. Uh, Evanik, Cho, and Maritza. Evanik. Yeah, I, I think because the system works so well that we don't even realize it's a system. I think it's, it's also partially that we don't think in a systems type way. Like this is fairly new thinking for, uh, I know for me especially, but uh, for a lot of people, this is a new way of thinking. And it's because, and James brought it up in our group, we have the system set up already, like our life. And I think Maritza brought this up too, is that we have, like, it's so automatic for us. Like we, we were born into this. So of course we don't really notice it. And it works well that we don't know, notice that there's a system, um, at least until we're like way older. And even then you kind of know, but you don't really pay attention to it because it does work so well. And in other countries, it doesn't work as well as it does here in America. So yeah, I think because it works so well, the systems that we don't even know. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Joe, Maritza and Charlie. Joe. Well, it, it's interesting. Um, it, if the system's not working, it's going to send you a signal, right? And, and that's the people essentially. If you can't get food or things like that along those lines, it's a signal and then the, the system's disrupted. I wouldn't say it's working so well. I would just say it's working. And because there's a difference between the ideal and what the system is. So you could be, you know, there's ways of, you know, keeping populaces satisfied, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's it's an ideal state by any stretch of the imagination. And I think that that kind of hits on something that's really important for the book when you're talking about what is real, what is true, and what is ideal. You know, it's real. So anyway, I'll keep it short. Wonderful. Thank you. Next up is uh, Maritza, Charlie, and Mike. Maritza. I think it's a, a yes answer. I think that we... It's the concept where, you know, we're told in this chapter that when you see the whole, be careful and remember that your whole is just a part of a bigger and greater whole. And I, I suspect that we lose sight of that all the time. And that's the reason why. So um, as Evanique said, we, we're not in general aware that, you know, we live in a systematic world, especially those of us who are fortunate enough to live in the Western world it is a little bit like a well-oiled machine on, on one level. And because it's functioning, we have the luxury of forgetting that we're a part of that whole. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, Charlie, what's your answer? Okay, first of all, I, I reject the hypothesis. So, I mean, the, the original uh, statement, uh, we're headed towards a major collapse of our, of our culture. And, and, uh, and it used to be, okay, 150 years ago that when people were living on farms, they knew their place in society. They knew how everything worked and it wasn't, wasn't a big mystery. Now with, uh, with a technology, especially artificial intelligence and so on, and, and the uh, declining need for, for the mass, vast majority of people. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is, is that, that uh, uh, and this is, I know, uh, not politically correct to say this, but the vast majority of people are so simple minded that they aren't able to understand what's going on, but they know that it's got their, you know, the bullet has their name on it. Okay. And, uh, and, and so a lot of people are, are, are feeling, you know, um, a cut out of, of, of things and, and they, they, they think that they're going to be among the people who are throwaway people who will be, you know, dying on the streets because of lack of work. And, and so it's, it, it's, it is not the case that, that um, uh, that that um, well, let me rephrase that. It is the case that people will be happy when they get what they want because most people really don't care more than just getting their mundane concerns, you know, uh, being able to have a meal on the table and so on, and maybe having some fancy uh, uh, clothes or a car or whatever. But the, you know, the vast majority of people just they they don't care about what is reality. They don't care about the big picture. They just they don't have the mind for it. Okay, to me, to be Thank perfectly you. honest. Thank so, you. you know, anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. 
So what you're saying is most people are not aware, are not able to think about. They don't care. You know, they, they, they don't. Care. They don't want to. You know, it's it's just they know what they want, and, they, and, and when they don't get it, they get pissed. Okay, it's pretty next much that up, simple. Next up is going to be. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Next up is going to be Mike A followed by Mike S followed by Marco. Mike A. Yeah, you can call me the non-magical Mike. Non-magical Mike. Real, so not real Mike. The real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just think in general, I don't think it's humanly possible to get a grasp on systems entirely. I mean, if you look out to the universe and then come onto the earth and break down, break down systems to the cellular level, you're not going to have any time to live. I just think at some point you need to have what's in your what's in your view and what's in your understanding and maybe break down one or two significant parts or similar systems, but to keep going uh i just think there's too vast there are too many systems within systems it would be overwhelming thank you mike uh next up is mike uh mike s marco and prakash mike s well M mike s uh, i i'll expand on mike a's uh answer um, you don't have and, to stick uh, to the mic but go uh, ahead that uh Okay, we, we, what we, uh, we, and this is something that Jeff always says, we don't know what we don't know, the unknown unknowns. Now, the situation is such that uh, some of these things we can't know, because our, um, our, um, we evolved to keep track of X, Y, Z, and T, um, four variables at the most. And that was uh, uh, the uh, God gave us that evolution. And uh, some of these problems involve thousands of variables. And uh, it's not possible to visualize the graphs of that kind of nonlinear optimization. It's not possible to visualize the decision space. Um, now, Gary Kasparov. Got, got it. I, I think that's, that's an excellent that point, out, Mike. And so that's why he couldn't. Mike, excellent point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I want to make well, sure that the, the, the excellent point is follows. The excellent point isn't there yet. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Just keep it short. Okay. Want to hear so the real excellent point? Okay. Please, please go ahead. I, I okay. can't see your hand. So okay. 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 15 you, you, seconds. You, go you ahead. 15 seconds. Your screen, so I can't see your hand. Okay. Okay. All right. So, folks, folks, uh, folks, folks now, now let, let me introduce a new feature Zoom, new Zoom feature that I've come up with for moderating. It's called, I, I, I've struggled very hard to decide what to call it. I call it the hand. The hand means that you got 15 seconds. So, that way, just by visual signal, you will know magically without interrupting your audio that you got 15 seconds to wrap up. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Okay, South Park used the hand too. The teacher on South Park used the hand. Watch the hand. Okay, the problem is that you uh, can't uh, keep track of these kind of dimensions. And so uh, art of, uh, the, some uh, Ch Charlie said AI is gonna make that happen and uh, that's why gary kasparov uh, uh, decided gave up his chess career and decided to run to be head of russia wonderful uh, thank you thank you mike worked he's the only guy who got to be head of russia I... without getting assassinated he didn't thank get you. to be head of russia but he didn't get killed like all the other thank you thank you mike mike 15 seconds is 15 seconds it can't be 20 i give you 30 seconds Okay, uh, next up is going to be uh, Marco followed by Prakash. Marco. Um, probably like the people don't take the time to just take a step back. Um, and also like just people don't know any better. <laughs> I guess they don't, they don't know any better to, you know, to see beyond what they're, you know, what's, what they know. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, next up is Prakash. Prakash, go ahead. Uh, uh, I, I think system works. Okay, this is what, when we are looking at it. Um, system are made with different small objects and the, those objects are uh, are influenced by the data um, and, and stuff like that. So we can quantitatively measure the success of individual object 
and further by the, of the system itself. Okay. And it is extremely impossible to create a perfect system because systems are, are built to meet the needs of the many which comes into the standard deviation or the bell curve at the center. The system will meet the needs of 70, 80% of the people. And 20% of the people, somebody who's like extremely talented student or somebody who has a lot below average students, systems are not gonna uh, meet the needs thank of you. those two sides. Uh, thank you, thank you, Prakash. Um, I, I wanna say, I mean, one of the principles that I learned from Jordan Peterson is that don't denigrate the systems, you know, the, the, the traditions that you are dependent on. I think we actually depend on lots of systems, lots of integrations, which are actually foundations of our life. Many, 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 many things that we did not create ourselves, we are depending on that for our lives. And we have to be grateful for that. And we have to be aware of that. And that is the starting point of it. There, of course, there are lots of things wrong with many of the systems, but I think you have to start with that and then, then build off that. Um, next up is the question of, so now there we have got three questions. One, I want to go through all of them very quickly. Um, how do we manage change of systems? Um, what is the importance? What is the importance of buy-in uh, into systems? And what destroys systems from inside? Okay, so let's take the most uh, most interesting question. What destroys a system? What what disrupts the system? Um, if you have answer, uh, if you would like to answer that, go ahead, uh, Maritza. I think the opposite of what makes it stronger. So a lack of change, a lack of, um, you know, making these des design judgments because, you know, we're told that, um, you know, if you don't make a decision, something's gonna happen anyway. And I think if we continue to just float and let the chips fall where they are, it's just gonna all unravel. Oh, very good. I, you know what, let's combine it with the question of change because the disruption is a kind of a change. So how do you change systems? How do you uh, disrupt them on one side and how do you improve them on the other side? Folks, try to keep your answers brief. Um, Charlie, what's your answer? I think it's related to the question I asked about buy-in. Basically, uh, the more people who don't buy into the system, the less stable the system becomes. And if you have people that are not only not buying into the system, but are actually hostile, people who are being hurt by the system, then that is, you know, uh, there's the common understanding that revolutions happen when 80% of the population are hostile to the government and 10% of the population are willing to die to get rid of this, the government. Right now, we have about 90% of the American people are opposed to the uh, wealthy people owning the U.S. government, okay? And uh, hopefully it's uh, not going to come to the, to, you know, the, the option, you know, anyway. Thank whatever. you. Uh, we, we don't go too much into politics, but uh, the next up is going to be Joe followed by YJH. Joe. Um, so, wait a minute, could you re-ask? Because uh, it was yeah, they, different. The question is about systems in general. Okay. What is it, it that disrupts systems? What does it take? I think, system? I mean, I think what, what disrupt, I mean, I, I, I think that actually what Maritza said was, was excellent in the sense that uh, I think once a system becomes stagnant, that's problematic. Um, and so I think what would be really important for a system to actually be able to thrive is that certain things need to die in a system. So cycles need to have need to occur. And when those cycles are prevented from happening, then a sim system limps on until it actually can no longer then it then it really implodes. So I, I think that it's important for, uh, for cycles. Uh, and then there's all kinds of innovation thoughts as well, I have, but I'll leave it at that. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next up is YJH, Kevin and Prakash. YJH. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Because um, I, uh, I have 30 seconds, right? <laughs> Something like yes. that. Um, because I'm kind of have upbringings in Eastern culture. I'm coming from China. 
So most of my early days I was in there and I learned science and engineering in the US. So I had the scientific trainings in here. And then I, my best friend is also, he is a Westerner. So he's I have up, upbringings, upbringings in Christianity family and also science and a whole bunch of that. So I feel like I, I, I see the challenge of all this three all the time. So my way of doing that is first is of, of, of course to keep an open minded to sure to make sure that every point or every kind of things have certain uh, circumstances. It's like you, you have a whole bunch of variables to meet up all that. But also it's seeking for the more general solutions. And for me so far is I find my roots is more grounded into the Eastern philosophy and Eastern approach. So such as they have a ho very holistic mm -hmm. and very artistic and very responsive way of treating the change. Such as in, if you're talking about the change and then uh, the famous book called I Ching is the book about change and how you're going to react to it. Yep. And then I think for Asian TCM, they also have two ways of trying to uh, understand it. First, this is through a systematic structural way to understand it and to try to react to it properly. Second is totally through the responsive way. It means your full body, you let your full body go and then let full body react and then let the body lead you towards and into a cer certain type of unconscious, unconscious kind of mind leading you to. So okay. there are two different ways. And I think structure is easy to help people to grasp to a certain level but this is not all. This is only have this limitation to some level and to some day, Wonderful. whenever you meet that part. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Vaijesh. Uh, excellent observation. And I am glad you brought up uh, I Ching. Uh, I mean, that's actually very, very interesting in terms of kind of systematically looking at the kinds of change that are possible and what kind of states you're in, it, you could possibly be, and how, how do you do the kind of combinations of those and kind of think about them systematically. So that's that's a great great point. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin, Prakash, and Marco. Kevin. Yes, thank you. Uh, for me, as designer, who's going to benefit other than you pay pay you and get a buy in? So intention is very important, I would say. Uh, intent what, focus. What, what is what is what is very important? Intention. Okay, intention. So you, who is the first priority intention? It's it's the money or the project itself for client. It's uh, the first, it generally not normally first design, not a fit of reality. That's the, how to prepare for change. I like uh, Marisa said, your your whole and you know, that's another point. Your whole is a part of a bigger whole. Uh, how do you fit in another big uh, environment? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next up is Prakash, followed by Marco. Prakash. Uh, I think um, the one most important thing that changes the system is time. With time, the perception changes, people's percep perception changes. And also, it brings in the new players into the game. Uh, the, the system designers always try to integrate something called um, um, uh, continuous improvement mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing, right? But what happens is because the success of the system itself becomes a problem because system was working nice yesterday or last year or last decade, the, the stakeholders of the systems are less likely to deploy those self-correcting mechanism and that becomes a problem. And there is opens a new opportunity for the chaos and the new systems. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Prakash. Next up is Marco. Marco, go ahead. Um, probably like if a new part is introduced to the system and it doesn't integrate with the system. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Mike S. Mike S. Go ahead. Okay, the way um, ACOF would describe all of the things we just heard is a multi criteria objective function. And the way you describe designing time and uncertainty in is you want to, uh, uh, to pre present the objective function 
in terms of um, of upper control limits and lower control limits and probability distributions and uh, to optimize so that the system uh, for example might be um, expandable might be able to handle unforeseen circumstances mm -hmm. now um, you're trying to do that consistent with uh, not throwing more money um, uh, at, at the problem than you can afford and more weight and energy consumption than you can afford. Thank so, you. Uh, you have all these boundary values and, uh, and so you have to design your criteria yep. to match. So, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, I mean, I really appreciate you bringing in the mathematical perspective, you know, how do you actually mathematically quantify these things? How do you deal with it? Um, that's that's very, you know, that's that's crucial. Um, next up is uh, YJH. YJH, go ahead. Uh, just on me. Thank you very much. I just want to bring one layer of the Eastern philosophy. We're always talking about yin and yang, which is like a positive and negative, if you understand it mathematically. And then what I try to point out is like, one thing such as intention, good intention that just, I just make it for example, but not for any other like reference. It's have is overall 100% good whenever it's under certain circumstances, but it can be really low value whenever you put it under a different circumstances or different perspective. So when we put a word or promoting a certain ideas, we want to know what is the limitation of that? What would be the time space for the right kind of purpose we're trying to promote. But uh, we also need to find out, we also need to understand what would be the um, un, I mean, unproposed consequences that might happen, mm -hmm. what might be the damage. So just don't th think about, you can de uh, get an answer just with one word, but think about what, when it will be doing good and when will, will, will we not doing the, the right thing. Thank you, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, really uh, good observation. Thank you again. Um, so, um, I mean, the way I think about it is I, I like uh, Louis Sullivan's way of form and function. Um, basically, most forms that are created by functions get out of whack with the functions. Functions uh, move in a different way. Uh, forms become no longer matching that. They still uh, kind of keep some of the functions and you have to keep the function alive in order to continuously uh, you know, work on the forms. Um, last question. Now this answers have to be very, very short and then we'll wrap up. What's the role of buy-in from st stakeholders in systems? What is the importance of buy-in? Anybody? Avanik? Um. Buy-in, especially with stakeholders, is so important. Um, I think because they could either make the system work or sabotage it, and I've seen both um, in creating systems. Um, if they don't like it, then they won't use it or won't buy into it, or or they'll actively, you know, turn other people against it. It is very hard to come back from that. So uh, I think you definitely have to buy in to it in order to have it to work. Wonderful. OC followed by Joe. OC. Yeah, I just want to quickly add that um, someone earlier mentioned that uh, relevancy of the system of it being used creates um, integrity of the system. And um, at this point, buy-in is important because lack of buy-in creates lack of integrity within that logic. Wonderful. Uh, next up is uh, Joe. Yeah, I mean, um, it, I think it also depends on the size of the system itself. Uh, so if you're talking about an entire uh, political system, I, you know, that or an organization, an organization, mm -hmm. it could die very quickly if you have no buy-in from your stakeholders. Uh, from a political system, it just has to make room for discontent. That's all it doesn't necessarily have to squash it. Thank you. Maritza. What came to mind for me is the idea that um, almost more critical than the actual literal buy-in is the 
acknowledgement that, you know, everything is connected to everything else. And I think that we have a, at least a shot maybe of buy-in or even an indirect buy-in if people can at least understand that, you know, nobody stands alone. That's the hardest part, I think. Wonderful. Folks, next week, we are going to be talking about God, guarantor of design. So looking forward to that. Uh, and thank you very much, everybody. We will see you. Uh, we've got incredible meetups coming up every day. So don't, don't miss any of them. See ya. Bye. We'll be talking about God all week. Yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, the uh, only thing is that uh, the the on Wednesday, um, Sanjay is going brain to brain. be about talking about God in our cells, in our, that, our brain, in our brains. Yes. All right. See you. <laughs> Take care.